Okay, I think we're, we're probably going to get interrupted because we asked people to bring in water and stuff like that, but we might just kick it off uh, and, and start the conversation. Um, so you're all, you're all very welcome. Thanks for coming in out of the gorgeous sunshine to sit in a, a darkened theatre. Um, my name is Kieran Moore. I'm the manager of Dublin Community Television. And, and I suppose before that I was involved in indie media. So for the last 10 years I've been involved in alternative media but have never actually taken on the burden of a, of a printed uh, journal in any form. Um, so I think that was why I was asked to come in and, and chair a discussion amongst a group of people who have decided that, that that's part of what th their particular activity is. Um, and I think it's, it's, sort of, it's a good thing to be in the book fair and looking at this. Um, for the last 15 or 20 years, there's been loads of people like me going around and saying that technology is going to change the way we communicate and offers all these potentials and things like that. And um, sometimes I think you lose sight of the fact that the technology is only a means, but behind it there has to be people and there has to be an organisation. So one of the things I think wanted to have a chat about was not so much the stories that are in these journals. I'm sure everybody here has, has read them <coughs> or at the very least should go out and have a look at them. But who uh, the journals are talking to and also who's making them and how it is affecting the, the organisations or the groups that are behind them. I suppose underneath it all, trying to have a think about are the journals effective as organising tools and how do they relate to the organisations that, that have chosen to put energies into this. I'm um, going to do it fairly relaxed, so I think the idea will be we're going to run up, up around the table and everybody's just going to introduce themselves, the journal that they're in, you, you know, the, the frequency and, and, and uh, numbers, and then um, we, we might have a look at discussing audience first and then uh, how, how the, the pieces themselves are produced. If anybody wants to come in during the course of the conversation, we'll open it up because I think the idea is that it should be fairly interactive. Um, but we'll definitely try and create a bit of space at the end at about, what, what we're running to one, are we? Or to half twelve. <laughs> Anybody got a program? Till mm -hmm. one. He's organising all the reading. No, I'm not. <laughs> okay, well, I, I, I'm going on the assumption that we're running to <laughs> one. So we definitely, yeah, around, around 20 to one, we, we'll try and open the conversation up if people haven't come in before that. Is that okay? Okay, so maybe we just run around the table and I let people introduce themselves as they go down. Okay, uh, I'm Andrew Flood uh, with the work of Solidarity Movement. Uh, I realised when I was thinking about this last night that it's funny I ended up here because the last few years I've actually been pushing our online stuff uh, as, uh, rather than the printed stuff. But uh, in terms of print publications, we do two things. Uh, one is work of Solidarity, which is a free newspaper produced six times a year. Uh, we we're producing 10,000 copies of it, um, and we've dropped that to 4,000, and I'll explain some of the thinking behind that when we get around to the audience uh, discussion. Uh, the other thing we produce is the Irish Anarchist Review. This comes out twice a year. We've just an issue out for the book first, so make sure you pick up one for yourself and 50 for all your mates, because uh, there's 1,500 of them in the basement. Uh, it's also free, um, and yeah, I think that's what I meant to say. Yep. So, yeah, I'm James, and I'm one of the editors of Rabble magazine. Uh, I guess in one way Rabble is sort of modelling itself on a lot of the underground and free press of maybe the 1960s and 70s. It's certainly somewhere where we take a degree of inspiration from. Um, I've heard somebody once describe it as basically a magazine that sits in between the left and the city. So um, it, can be, it can kind of seem rather confused in what it's trying to do, but um, we print 5,000 copies. We have a solid enough distribution grid across Dublin, just using cafes, pubs, bars, venues. Um, we're sort of angling at trying to make it a reader-supported newspaper, which is probably something that hasn't been done in quite a while in Dublin, or maybe I'm wrong on that, but um, that's where we're trying to take it as a model. We do it four times a year. Well, uh, my name's Scott Miller. I work for uh, Liberty Newspaper. That's it there. It's uh, Sipto's publication. I, uh, only this morning I was having a look to find out when it actually started, and uh, I see it started in 1948 as the official organ of the ITGWU, That's what, that was its title. Uh, currently, for the last 18 months about, we've been publishing one a month. Initially the print run was 50,000, it's now 35,000. It's distributed throughout the country to um, trade union members, to trade union activists. We've recently started uh, selling it in Easton's as well, and we try and get it out to independent bookshops. Its core aim is to try and offset some of 
the false impressions that are given about current economic policy, current economic situations and uh, the trade union movement to our membership. Um, it's obviously swimming against a fairly large tide of the mainstream media that would have a certain ideological position, but we can only try. I work along with Frank Connolly, in it, uh, who you may have heard of, who's a fairly experienced journalist that's done a lot of good work down the years, and I myself used to work in uh, um, mainstream newspapers for the last 10 years. Uh, my name's Kevin Brannigan. I'm on the editorial board of Look Left. Um, Look Left has been going for quite a long time, but myself and a few others only took it over, I suppose, in 2010, and we're currently working on our 11th issue. Um, the sponsors behind it are the Workers' Party, but it's a broad left, non-dogmatic magazine. Uh, we're buying monthly. We've had articles from Andrew, from people on the left of the Labour Party, and from people on various Labour or various left-wing parties in Ireland. Um, we sell it in Easons and in independent bookstores uh, all around the island. Um, people were actually quite surprised when we got it sold in Easons because people always seem to have the presumption that Easons were uh, big bad capitalists that didn't want you to sell their, your left-wing propaganda in them, when in fact they just wanted to make money. And if a magazine sells, therefore you can sell whatever you want to sell in it. Um, we're currently working on our 11th issue, which should be out in the first week of June if uh, we do a bit more work. And, uh, that's it. I'm Angela Caraccio. I'm in RAG, which is a revolutionary anarcho-feminist anarcho group, and we put out a magazine called The RAG uh, once a year, um, except last year, which we sort of skipped. Uh, we do everything uh, collaboratively, from uh, article idea generation to um, editing, proofreading, distribution, uh, everything is completely uh, done within the group, um, but we are kind of in the process of uh, rethinking of the way we do kind of everything. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens <laughs> if, we, if we're still putting out the magazine. We're kind of considering going online only. I suppose actually that that was one thing that I, I meant to ask everybody to say in their introduction. They didn't was just in in terms of publications. I, I know, I mean, Andrew mentioned that WSM obviously has a, a big web presence and a lot of your material will go out online only and then sometimes into the journals as well. Rabble is, is it's always print, is it? Or um, we print it first and print then... Print it first and then the same content. Yeah, we online. feed content online over basically three months after an issue to kind of generate like a feedback loop on Facebook and Twitter and so on. So. And Liberty is been publishing stories online between issues, isn't it? Uh, well, SIP2 runs its own news website now as well, and uh, the PDF is published online, and some of the stories are then put onto the news site. And the news site actually, the stories are produced, put on the news site, and then they feed into the uh, yep. publication once a month. So it's uh, fairly much the same content is available both on the internet and, and printed. Uh, in terms of look left, we have a website, but it's very under underused, under, and we. Uh, we actually don't pay a lot of attention to it, which is something that we should work on. Um, past issues, such as this one, are hosted on Politico.ie, uh, that, that website. But uh, we, don't, we don't host them ourselves on our own website. Um, we, we put all our energy into the magazine, into getting it printed, into getting it done. And it takes so much energy that by the time that we have it out there, mm -hmm. when it comes to looking at the website, to be honest, we just, we're, just, we're, it, it, we're, we're it, too it, exhausted it. from doing a magazine to then go and to put energy into the website. So. We're, we're, we're probably 10 years behind. Because yeah, it's not just about making the magazine, like then you've got to distribute it and do every, you know, all the follow-ups. It's great to have a product, but at the end of the day, you've got to sell it. And then it just takes so much time. And, and that, that sort of leads us into this, this discussion around audience, because I think, you know, SIP2 is an organization that has a whatever, 200,000 members. <laughs> so, you know, you have an audience. And yeah. everybody else, though, in some extent, has to go out and try and find an audience and build an audience. I mean, I mean, do, maybe if we started with Liberty, who's reading Liberty? Is it the SIP2 membership or is the audience outside of that? And who would you like to be reading? No, well, it is the SIP2 membership only because we, like, they have about 200,000 members, uh, maybe a bit less than that, quite a lot of unemployed members as well, people still members of the union. And we only print 35,000 copies now. We used to originally print 50,000. And so they are distributed out there. Now, I might be hopeful that half of them are read. I think that has to be like any publication, WSM publications, Rabble, Look Left, all of them. 
we, we should not over uh, expect what the actual readership is. It's a different readership than if you have a mainstream newspaper that so somebody pays the euro, they, they, they read it. So I'm hoping that, you know, I know in the, the mainstream press then they say the readership's actually bigger than the amount that is sold because more people went to read it. Originally, uh, with the sort of radical press when it first came around in the 18th century, they used to reckon they used to bring them into reading rooms and uh, 20 people would hear yeah. every copy of the Northern Star or whatever in, in Ireland that was uh, published. I would hope that maybe about 10,000 to 15,000 active trade union members read Liberty every month, look at the website. And if we were getting our message out to that amount of people, and if the message was clear, I think that's, that's, that's a fairly good readership. We, we, shouldn't be, uh, uh, we shouldn't be expecting great things from uh, publications, I think, at the moment. I think there's a lot of development for left-wing publications, and we're lucky enough if we're reaching people who are already interested in left-wing politics, far less we getting out to the general public. Of course, that's where the aim has to eventually be. I, th I think, though, that is one of the things that's harder with a, a newspaper, is, is in terms of looking at readership and audience, if you're online, you can just count them. You know, and you can also count how long people are looking, and, and you, you get this benefit where, you know, I, I mean, I, I know that in the workplace, in the office that I would be in, there'd be loads of left-wing publications, but you would see things that are picked up all the time. You know, you would see sort of when somebody is sitting in a chair, they will pick up the same magazines and things. And it is the production quality and, and things like that change the nature of, of how you relate to readers. I mean, it, it, when, when you're producing different journals, are you producing them for different types of readers or for different engagement with them? And how do you think people actually relate to the physical copies? Um, yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the paper and the magazine were completely different audiences. Uh, the paper for a long time, now we're kind of reducing this now, but for a long time most of the distribution was actually door to door, like not knocking on people's doors, but putting them through the letterbox. So it was very much aimed at just anybody out there whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And in terms of what we were trying to write, that was the kind of style we were trying to write in. The magazine, on the other hand, is produced for the Dublin Anarchist Book Fair and the London Anarchist Book Fair. So it's basically the audiences, people who go to Anarchist Book Fairs. So it's a very different sort of It's a theoretical article. journal for... Yeah, it's sort of like more, more theoretical, very much longer articles, very much more detailed. Uh, probably some of them are a lot more obscure as well. You know, okay. like if you put it through somebody's door box, they'd be going, what the hell are they talking about this for? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's a, a very big gap between those two. Now, with the paper, we're, we've, we're now shifting from that door-to-door -door model, partly because it takes so much time in terms of distribution. Uh, to doing a smaller print run and aiming it more at the people who would turn up for demonstrations, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's going to be assuming a bit more kind of knowledge and interest on, on behalf of the readership. Uh, and shifting the kind of older news style aimed at everybody's stuff is mostly going to the web. Well, when you're handing it out door to door, uh, I mean, you're in certain geographic areas, mm -hmm. I'm assuming, just where, where you would have branches or, or organised. Are you covering local news or are you covering national news? Like, do you take account of your readership down to that level to say, you know, this is a Northside Dublin paper or anything? I, no, I think that that's one of the reasons I'm kind of shifting off that model because I think in order to make that work, you'd have to be doing local news stories. And mm -hmm. we did a couple of experiments five years ago with doing local news sheets. It was interesting because we actually got physical letters back in from that. I think, okay, a couple of them were kind of bark, barking mad, but it was still the case that people were getting it going, oh, this is some relevance to me, I'm going to send them. A letter, I, which I, I have friends who live just up uh, off Oxford Town Road, mm. who, who I think get dropped into the door and have no knowledge of anarchism other than through this paper, but have, have a very sort of you know well-meaning. Oh yeah, no, they're nice people, you know, compared <laughs> to if, if you have another knowledge of, of anarchism. Yeah, yeah, yeah they probably been getting it for about ten years. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah, that, you know, that's one of the areas that we've consistently been hitting, and partly that's got, well, a good few people living. Uh, around Stony Bad, and the other reason is nobody's got front doors, our front garden, so it's much quicker. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Rabble, I mean, uh, you have an idea in your head of, of the, the radar very consciously, but you're, you're dropping it into certain locations where yeah, people Yeah, I, I think, I mean, we're probably coming from a different angle on it, where we don't think there's actually there's a captive audience out there that we can go and tap into. I mean, we know there's an audience out there for what we're doing, but what we're trying to do with the paper is actually construct our audience through the way we write it and the way we develop it and the way we design it. So, I mean, in, in many ways, you could say that's a cynical strategy. Say, if we want to have our newspaper distributed on the north side, we'll, int yeah, we'll interview street literature and make them and effectively like their whole crew and their whole scene part of our audience by letting the audience have a voice in the paper. We, we kind of did the same thing with basically you know, the trade union movement. We want our paper to be read by young workers. So we go do a subject relevant to them, like say the Job Bridge article, 
interview mandate, and then that, that gives us an audience in the trade union movement. So we, we do How, how though do you get the journal to them? Even if it covers their story, yeah. the distribution does that not get any, well, a major part of it? Physically distributing yeah. it, I mean, um, you know, like, that's like I mean, there's those centres all over the city. Uh, mm -hmm. the, our readership play quite a large role in distributing the paper as well, as in we can handle Dublin, but I mean, we get to like cities uh, down the country as well, and that wouldn't happen without, say, basically people on Facebook popping up, going, I'm going down to a gig in Cork, do you want yeah. me to take two bundles? And it's like, yeah, there you go. So we, we, we've quite an active readership, like. And the, when you're writing, though, are you conscious of the, it, it's a quarter, you know, that you're not writing time-sensitive material? And yeah, how long do you think a, 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 an issue lasts? Yeah, like, I mean, that's, yeah, we, we don't do time-sensitive stuff. For instance, it'd be very easy for us to uh, try play to a captive audience by reviewing gigs or writing write-ups of political demonstrations, but mm -hmm. that's done on the internet now. So yeah. that, that has no relevance to the longevity of the project. So, I mean, I do think it's quite important that in the radical press, the readers see themselves. You know, for instance, if you're talking about working class issues, then why aren't there working class voices in radical papers? Like, mm -hmm. So we're talking yeah. about these issues. We see quotes from people involved in the struggle. And the okay. same applies to a DIY music scene. We get people involved in those scenes to write the stories. So it, it is actually a newspaper of these communities. Okay, and, and, and I'm sure that raises loads of editorial issues, which we might touch on when, when we go into the second part of the discussion. Just, I mean, looking at RAG, I know we did, uh, uh, RAG were in, yourself and Claire were in DCTV when we were discussing um, Banshee, a, a, a feminist journal from the 1970s. And it really struck me at that time that RAG was sort of, it, it had a community, that it was very much all encompassing the, the way that you related to your readers. I almost get the sense that you, you sort of, you knew who your readers were on first name terms quite often, <laughs> you know, because it was that, that different relationship. Is that accurate or how would you? What's a nice way of saying we're, you know, very niche. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we, our target audience, we try to stay away from being too academic. Um, and, you know, sometimes we veer that way and we pull ourselves back a bit. Um, but we, we're sort of really bad at distributing our magazines, to be honest. So we tend to sell it you know, anarchist book fairs and other kind of like-minded events. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the people that would even come upon the RAG um, would be a very specific kind of person. Mm -hmm. uh, we were selling online for a while, and even, even somebody who would buy it online would be a specific kind of person. You know, they wouldn't just happen upon it, <laughs> they would be looking for it. So um, yeah, I, I find the biggest problem is not really wondering about who's buying it, but it's more about who's reading it. Because, you know, the people we sell to, uh, a lot of times, I think, just buy it. Um, and, and do you seek to engage it, with people? I mean, are, are, are you talking to people about, because that, you know, I mean, it's one of the things that when we're doing television programs, like, you know, we don't get any feedback at a, a lot of the time. And you, you put something out there and you're going, that, that was a great piece of work. I wonder what everybody thinks of that. And then you go, well, nobody told me. So, you know, and it, is, it, it can be discouraging when you're producing media that you almost actively try and seek reader feedback. Yeah, we get emails quite, quite often. And in the old days, because we've been around for eight years, uh, we'd actually get physical letters, which was great. Fan mm. mail is always nice. But, um, yeah, I, I think... Um, you just have to put it out there and and just trust. It's sort of like being a, a radio DJ. You know, mm -hmm. you, somebody out there is liking it. You just yeah. have to put your faith in it, even if somebody's calling, telling you like this is the worst song I've ever heard. So, uh, you know, I think with the rag, a lot of the articles are very personal. Mm -hmm. um, so they're the kinds of things that I think people have a really hard time responding to uh, publicly, or just you know, they, it might be really meaningful to them, but they're not gonna reach out to us and, and say so mm -hmm. always. Yeah. I mean, it does happen, but, um, so we just work on faith, basically, and. Okay. Yeah. And just the, the last journal has the thing that everybody I've ever known that got involved in Left Wing Press wanted, which was Easton's distribution. Yeah. Um, so it, does that mean that you, you're now part of the, the capitalist press? <laughs> I'd like to think so. Are we not, are we not trying to build <laughs> something different? Yeah, I'd like to think we are part of the capitalist press. <laughs> um, <laughs> I do see myself as a latter-day Tony O'Reilly, <laughs> but uh, um, I, I, just, just on something I said earlier that we don't engage with the internet, we, we do engage quite heavily with Facebook, 
and um, I've seen, which which is something I've seen over the, uh, when we started off, it was at 100 followers, 200 followers, and I was like, are we ever going to hit a thousand? And then just all of a sudden, since uh, the turn of the the new year, we've we've <coughs> we shot up with a 600 rate, we're 600 followers on Facebook. So I'm thinking maybe maybe it's getting out there a bit more. But the, the thing with Ethan's in the 26 counties, it's delivered into 147 shops. So that's there, there could be this on O'Connell Street. They put in about 60, 80 issues, depending. But in other shops, uh, high street shops, it's only 140 shops around shops around the island. And you can go on the internet. You can get whatever you want on the internet. You click a mouse if you know what you're searching for. But I, I just like to think that it well, it it, it kind of makes me feel good that people can go into a shop in somewhere that an area in Ireland that there may not be a lot of politics going on, there may not be a lot of discussion going on, because sometimes when you're in Dublin, you get too Dublin-centric and you're like, oh, there's a meeting on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and no, you go to a meeting every night of the week. Well, in a lot of areas of the country, there's not a lot of political engagement. So I'm thinking if someone walks into a shop, a teenager or whatever, sees up left, picks it up, they might start engaging a bit with politics. Mm -hmm. But you could say you can do that on your own laptop, but it's just, I think it's different when you go in and you pick it up and you spend two euro and you invest a bit of money into buying it. So that, 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 that's my whole thing with Eason's. But uh, people always say that to me, go, oh, I can't believe it's an Eason's, how did you get Eason's? All I did was ring up and ask them, could we stock it? And e e Eason's, um, I, I'm not sure if they, they, they used to stock political magazines, whatever, but they used to stock that fascist magazine, Hibernia. So like, if they're going to stock fascist magazines, why, why wouldn't they stop look stock look left? Um, we're just slightly more left of fascism. <laughs> but like, <laughs> the job. Um, yeah, but yeah. I, I think the Easton's, the Easton's thing is great, and for the, for the next issue, Easton's got on to me asking for more issues. So if they're getting on to you asking you for more issues, it must be good. Um, sometimes it is in the back of your head going, uh, maybe we can't do this, we can't say that, because it is out there in Easton's. And there's How much of your distribution goes through Easton's? Uh, not a lot of it. We distribute about, we print about 10,000 copies of each issue. Which is a little bit insane, I think. But uh, because because we're funded and sponsored by the Workers' Party, they have obviously their own. <laughs> <laughs> they, they have. Do you have any questions? Yeah. No, they they have their own distribution network, network because they have a party. Um, yeah. Actually, Tomas McGillar once said, uh, "The only such thing as free press is if you have your own printing press." Um, there you go. Do <laughs> <laughs> you want to come in, Scott? Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember what was going on. <laughs> but um, you know, the, the thing about the, the internet versus a, a print publication. Um, the internet, you can reach a lot of people, um, but it's very easy to put something out there on the internet. It can be a very small group of people putting something together and putting it out there. Mm -hmm. And the whole purpose of left-wing politics is meant to be organising people, organising the majority of people, organising the mass of people. And if people are going to just sit back and put things on the internet and go, yeah, that's great, I've got my views out there, that's individuals or that's small groups of individuals. What you need in a publication is you know, to establish a left institution, an institution that brings together a lot of people and it, it is a lot of work to produce it. Like someone like Luke left something like Liberty, it's intergenerational as well. It's not just one group mm -hmm. of people that are of a certain generation. You have to link ideas across generations, look at how models have been done before, and then put it out there. So the internet, yeah, it's a good way of getting ideas out there, but in actual organising, which should be the first thing of any left-wing organisation, should be its publication, its newspaper. Print is the only way that that organisation can actually be done. It can't be done by just putting out an internet site. Maybe by putting a television station. Yeah, that's how it can be done as well. But you need to have something that is, uh, you know, just a larger it, thing. Just I think there's also there's, a, there's another element where print actually really supports organising, and I think definitely you know coming together around a deadline and, and having to work together and, and trash out an issue is you know the, the production process. But it's also the actual act of transmission can be very personal, and you can hand it to somebody. I mean, is that something that you, you have yeah, I, I think consciously that this is something that starts a conversation? Yeah, I, and I, I, I think if you're just putting stuff on the internet, apart apart from a side of like blogs like Come Here to Me and stuff like that, which even though they're, they're bringing out a book at Christmas, but that that that's that they've shown how you can really do something really good on the internet. But I think if you're going to base uh, just having a blog on the internet or having a site on the internet. 
uh, like Politico, it leads to a lot of disengagement or something like that, you know? Whereas if you're making a magazine, you're doing stuff, you're engaging people with it, you're handing it out to them and people are getting engaged with it. Whereas if it's just the internet, you can kind of just do it from your bedroom and maybe I could be wrong and you could come up with a really good counter argument to it, but it leads to a lot of disengagement, I think. Just, just one quick thing, just to remember what I was meant to say when Kevin was saying about, like, you know, there's problems that you have to be worried about liable and all this if you're going into Easton's. That's a positive thing. Like, it's, if you have to, if you're able to just write whatever you want, put it out there, bang, that's it. Uh, yeah, that's great, you might be able to get the truth out there, but you're only actually tackling the establishment, taking on the power structures, if you're actually going out there and seeing, like, how far can I get the story? And that's educating people then that are producing the, the magazine to go, right, there really is a line you can't cross because the power structures in this country are so conservative. Like, what you can get into the British press is well beyond what you can get into the Irish press. Like, liable laws in this country are far too strict and they protect certain power interests, and that is... That is one of the major problems. Like, just on, on the Leaveson report, I've seen them, they've got the text messages of Dave and his, his uh, horse riding buddies are all, and they can have a look at it, and there's been a judicial inquiry. That happened, when, when was that? About 18 months ago, all that incident. In Ireland, Brian Cowan was out golfing with his mates, and they would have been drunk texting one another about, oh, jeez, I'm up the thing. We haven't got any of that. And that's yeah. because of the failure of the Irish press, the failure uh, to take on these power structures and it's all grand putting stuff on the internet putting out newspapers and all that you have to try and take them on at their own game sell your publication get in there and really, really and, and i think i mean one of the things when you look about liberty and look left you are looking at journals that organizations have said it we need a left-wing press and we need a mass left-wing press i think both of them have very decisively said we don't want to be the House Journal anymore. We want it to be something wider. I mean, you House Journals as well. Yeah, yeah. But, but, I, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's somewhat different. I know Andrew wanted to come in, and then I also wanted to talk to, to James about, without having an organisation there behind your journal, how that affects your, your, your idea of readership. Because in some ways, it, it serves a different purpose, maybe. But you wanted to come in on? Yeah, well, I, I think the, I mean, the, the discussion about the printed publication versus the online stuff is interesting. But I, I think the kind of perspective you're offering is quite old school on it. Um, like the, you know, the idea of the paper as the core organisational model for a party was something that definitely made sense back in the 1910s and the 1920s and probably up to 80s and 90s or whatever. But the way people engage with information now is very different. So, like, I mean, something we more or less all talked about was, you know, getting feedback from readers. You know, what, what articles people like, what they don't like. You, you briefly mentioned, well, if you have a website, you can, you know, you're getting metrics on this. But it's one of the things we found that's really interesting, uh, because we basically went for that kind of online first publication model sometime before The Guardian did, they stole it off us. But, you know, so we've been putting stuff up online first, off most of the articles uh, for quite a way back. But one of the really interesting bits of feedback you get is through something like Facebook, where you can see, well, how many people like something, how many people shared it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and as come here to me pointed out, I think we're the second largest political organization on Facebook and Ireland, which is kind of weird. You know, like only the Shinners are bigger, everybody else is, has got less. Um, and is that an age profile thing? I, I don't think so. Um, I think what it possibly is, is we've just been much more active online. Right. Uh, so we've been more visible. Uh, and we consciously started to build that from about 2007 on. We were kind of thinking about that. But in terms of engaging readers, that's interesting because one of the things about, say, liking our page on Facebook is you're actually making a public identification, you know, that your friends see and that maybe some of them follow. Same thing if you're sharing an article, same thing if you're liking an article. And I think there's a, there's a very different model of engagement with organization, with ideas, that revolutionary organization can need to take into account. You know, a lot of us are still working on models that I think are 19, but, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, they're quite old. On, on um, that, Andrew, like, like the WSM might be the most popular uh, political organization on Facebook or that, but it's definitely not the most powerful political organization in Ireland, you know, and that, <laughs> that's sort of like, you know, we, we can get a false impression if we only go by the internet or, or Facebook of what actually uh, the, the power is out there. And as I say, actually to have a publication that generates money is able to get uh, through networks, distribute through shops, has to be legal and all that. It's a uh, it's a bigger engagement with the with the power structures. You know, like you, you have to engage with them. You can, you have to build in opposition to them. You can't just do your own thing and try and ignore these things that are out there. And all grand, we we're all talking to one another and everything's great. And that's why I think there's a need like SIP2, the Workers Party. These organisations do exist out there. A lot of people might think they are stuck in the 1920s and 1930s. I was only interviewing a uh, Sir Kia 
uh, MP the other day, and like in Greece, they have managed to meld these things together. But when she was saying, I was like, so how are you left wing? She was like, well, my family were partisans and that. And I read the left wing press as I grew up. And that's what makes, that's what makes people left wing is actually reading the media. And OK, maybe it will all go to net based, but at the moment, people still want to read a newspaper and engage with a bit of paper. I think it'd be interesting to bring in Angela and James because to, to some extent, you know, the three organisations that have a, a, as part of their role is communication and, and is organising and choose to do it through, through physical journals as well as online. But I think both Rag and Rabble just are the journals. You know, the, yeah, well, the, there's two things. The first is we kind of hope that um, the things that we write about are sort of a, a document in the same way that if you read Banshee from the 70s, it's a real document for what was happening at that time and what people's experiences were. And you know, you can now find that it's, it's despite this idea that the internet is forever, it's kind of not, yeah. you know, and um, having the physical thing that you hope will last. Um, like I think Ban Banshees are in the National Library now. Mm -hmm. they're, they're a thing, they're a resource that you can look to. And I think that's what we kind of try to achieve. And the, the idea of going strictly to the internet is a bit scary in the sense that, okay, yeah, maybe more people will read it. But more people are prone to forget it as well. And you know, it's, it's kind of like out into the ether and there's just so much information, you know, and that next thing Facebook is gone. definitely not the first draft of history, <laughs> whatever the, the, yeah, the yeah. journal Yeah, yeah, so it's like the, the idea that we've got these physical magazines that uh, will get passed on and will, they'll be in people's houses and, okay, maybe they'll be recycled. <laughs> but, like, you know, at some point, these someone will find these and, you know, I think I think that, that series that we, we did, uh, DCDV did a series called Look Left, where we, we invited people in who had been editors in left-wing journals to talk to current activists and Conor McCabe sort of provided a lot of historical uh, research on it. And it was that idea that, you know, you could look back at struggles that happened 50 years ago and you could get these viewpoints. And they were really important resources and, it, and pulling these things out were, you know, hugely valuable. These, these sort of, and it was also something that reminded me that so many left-wing activists that I know have boxes of journals and they will go to them now and again, you know, generally when they're moving house or something, but there is that intergenerational <laughs> thing where there's, you, you're pulling out and you're looking at copies of the Irish worker and things like this, you know, and, and there is that. So just just on, on Rabble, I mean, you, you obviously Rabble is quite design-led as well, so you, you do think of the, the physical artefacts as you're producing it. Yeah, I think that kind of relates into the distribution mechanism, though. I mean, we were at the Radical Media Conference in London last year, and, you, you know, it was pretty good. You're meeting an awful lot of people who are doing similar projects but with widely varying politics. And sort of one of the most interesting uh, people I met was like an anarchist who'd gone through the Communist Party and so on. And he worked basically in a Ford factory somewhere in the north of England. And he was looking at Rabble going, oh shit, this reminds you of when we used to print fraud. And what fraud was is basically uh, a newspaper that replicated the company newspaper so they could give it out on the assembly lines. So we, we kind of have that conception with Rabble as well. Like we're taking stuff from what people consider the mainstream press, like very simple stuff, like an appreciation for aesthetic, because it makes people make a decision about what they pick up. It means we can go into coffee shop or coffee shops where people work, nightclubs, wherever, and leave it down. And the content could be quite explosive for a 15-year-old who picks it up, but people aren't looking at it and going, "Oh, this is just some lefty shite," and getting rid of it. Like so that's that's a very basic, like strategic thing that you have to do if you want to reach an audience. But like I'd pull it back to the internet conversation as well, because that seems really quite muddy. I mean. You know, like, if you, have, you have to look at, like, at heart what is the role of like, a radical paper, a radical media, and it's, it's a transformative thing. You're meant to be engaging with an audience, bringing them along with you. So to a large degree, their voice has to be within it. Um, and something I, I notice a lot in the traditional press is that there, there isn't actually the voice of the audience in it. I mean, I was reading a bit about Lenin and his kind of ideas about the paper there yesterday and so on, and I can't but feel well, he'd be a massive fan of Twitter and Facebook if he was around today. Because the whole goal of Pravda wasn't that it was an organ of the party; it was a forum for workers to, you know, share their stories and share their discussions. Like, you know, um, so I think in a way that's kind of what Rabble is trying to do now, where it's basically allowing people who may not necessarily see themselves as political, but may be coming to some level of conclusions, um, to just have a space where they see their concerns, their reality, and voice reflected back at them. And that's kind of where the term Rabble comes from, because it just allows people to see that. And, and the, the rabble is the reader rather than the producer. 
Yeah, pretty much. Like, that's why we are Robert. Like, we speak and we, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So. And as well, the, I mean, one of the things, because uh, Angela touched on it, but it, it is something that the, the feminist press, in particular in the 60s and 70s, quite often it, it, it tried to construct a process and a, a democratic means of, of printing which would represent people in a different way, that, that you weren't trying to speak to people, you, you were trying to create something. And I suppose, you know, part of the whole how do, how do we reflect our readers and how do we come in is how democratic we are as organisations and how open we are to ideas. I mean, do you think that, maybe we just start back with, with Rag, do you think that the pr production of a physical copy, that craft, helps you as an organisation? And how important is that in terms of choosing to do a newspaper rather? Because it, it, in some ways it's almost, it's a piece of craft or a piece of art that you're producing. You know, it, yeah. you could be putting a play on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, but it's, it's yeah, similar yeah. to a theatre company, I think, the process for, for a group like Rag. Uh, definitely, and I think um, we're very unique in the sense that uh, the process of making the magazine um, creates this community whereupon we, I mean, it can be a little insular, I think, but we're, we're we, we don't all, we're not all BFFs or anything, but, but we all support each other immensely. It's very, you know, well, it's an anarchist or organization, so there's so much collaboration and consensus um, that happens. Uh, and we're sort of unique in the sense that we do a check-in every, it sounds very girly, but um, it's so basically uh, like every time we meet, we just go around the room and say, like, you know, uh, like what's going on in our lives, how we're doing, and uh, so we're extremely bonded uh, in terms of a, as a And you meet as the RAG editorial co collective, is it? There is no, like, it's, yeah, like, RAG is, right at the moment, a publishing collective. In other words, our whole purpose of meeting, and, um, you know, coming together is to do the magazine, but and that's not actually how it really works out. It's kind of like our official party line, the true secrets of RAG. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, it's basically, I mean, we do a lot of <laughs> um, other things, you know, mm -hmm. besides magazine, and I think that's, that's the other crossroads that we're at at the moment, because the people who really were the first um, members of RAG, you know, they were writers, they were uh, people who were artists and very much into print, and now the current membership you know, are more doers uh, and are really kind of thinking, like, let's do more direct action, let's, you know, do mm. more events, let's have more workshops, let's, you know, do this stuff. So I think what I'm, what I'm thinking <laughs> will happen uh, if I get my crystal ball out will be that, you know, we'll have those members who do the stuff and then those of us who are more writers are going to be the documenters. So I think it's still really important to document um, what we do. and. Going back to Banshee, like I think a lot of that is like actual um, sharing of, of events, sharing like this is what happened, this is you know, this is what's going on, and you know because a lot of what we write about isn't going to be in the news, or it's not going to be um, anything in the mainstream media. So it's a way of you know, it's literally underground um, information dissemination. So I think. Um, yeah, I don't even remember your original question at this point. But basically, you know, it's like coming out of action mm -hmm. and the community that's created, uh, while we don't always, um, well, we kind of have like a strict way of doing things, um, it, it's hopefully organic out of like what's happening. Okay. Does that make sense? No, and, and I think though that the, the process of doing things does sort of create teams and create collectives. I've always wondered about Look Left. Are, are you all in the Workers' Party? Are, are you supporters? Uh, where, which came first, the, the relationship with the Workers' Party or the, or the newspaper, or just, just how, how the new launch happened? It has been recorded. <laughs> <laughs> well, we well, have for the American Secret Service. Yeah. Um, well, how it came about was the Workers' Party had Look Left mm -hmm. before we had Look Left. And um, they kind of they kind of got onto uh, someone who was on the editorial board with us and said, look, we've got this, uh, Scots, <laughs> um, and said, look, we've got this magazine where we put it out there, we're putting a lot of time and effort into doing it. Um, do, do you want to come and make it, I don't know, bigger? I wouldn't use the word better, because people who were doing it were doing it to, 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 a, good, to a good ability of what they were doing. But I'm not in the Workers' Party. Um, 
and the people who were involved in like the collective that we made up, mm -hmm. um, just, I'd say there's about eight of us. We've got people who are in the WSM, who might be kicked out now, um, <laughs> people in Labour Left, uh, Socialists, Republicans. People, it's, the, the whole ethos of the magazine is a broad left magazine. Mm -hmm. And it's not to be wishy-washy about socialism or anything like that, but it's a, it's a broad left magazine. So if you're coming from anywhere on the left, you can write in it um, as long as it's up to a good standard. Or, and that's and that's that's mirrored in the in, in the people who are involved in making it. And when it comes down to the actual like physical of uh, bricks and nails or whatever putting it together, there's about four or five of us who, who who get really involved in like sticking it together. But the people who are writing for it and the people who are putting ideas into how it should go, how it should look like, they're it's it's from the broad left. It's it's a magazine of the broad left. And I think it's it's great at the Workers' Party. It shows a real maturity of them that they're willing to put uh, all this money and and I suppose like let their name go out there on a magazine that doesn't reflect completely their views whereas they could just go with an in-house magazine like they were doing but I, I, I think it's really mature of them that they're they're willing to let these people take take their logo and, and their money and, uh, and and make a magazine with it and, and the, the group of people is that a regular group who are have been with it now over, over the course of a couple of years or well, is there entries and exits from that group and, and how does it constitute itself is it does it need sanction from the Workers' Party over who's involved, or are you sort of forming, self-organising? Yeah, it's, it's 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 myself and, and Scott and other people. Like, we 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 would have been the two along with uh, Brian Whelan, who was uh, who has been sent to London. Yeah, by. Yeah, he's tackling missiles at the moment. So like, it, it would have been the three of us that started it, and uh, as it's as that was back in 2010, March 2010, I think it was. And as it's gone on, more people have got involved and got involved, and the page numbers have gone up. But like, um, um, Sean Garland and other people in the Workers' Party, like, it seems to be the whole the whole ethos is to, to get more people involved and to to get it bigger, to get it, the, the distribution better, to get the, the layout better. And they don't mind who's involved in it, what 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 left wing political party they come from or don't come from. They they just want it to be a magazine of the broad left, and that's that's what I want it to be. I think, you know, and it is one of the things when sort of now that, because we started and we didn't have any journalists, but uh, Andrew went off and got them and put them on the table. When you see the quality of what's being produced and, and the, the, the breadth of both styles and that it is reaching outside the, the standard left wing press, um, I, I think there has been a, an effort over the last five years to do something in print. Hmm. And perhaps that's a reaction against the blogs, or, but definitely I think it's also informed by the blogs. I think there's an awful lot of people who have learned to write who are now starting to appear in journals and, and coming through, and you go, oh, I know that name from somewhere. And I, I think that is something that, that's very noticeable about Look Left, that it gives a platform to quite a broad, wide range of people mm -hmm. who, who have already built audiences. Like, that's the thing, I think the Irish media is getting so incestuous, such a small group of people involved in it. Um, not, not a small group of people, I would say, a, a, from a, a small background. Like I used to be an Irish uh, political journalist down there in the Dáil, and uh, myself and one other guy with an English accent were the two people that we'd say were from normal backgrounds. Everybody else was from uh, a middle class to upper middle class background. Uh, like not to be too classist about all this, and the only reason I think the two of us was there, because they couldn't really know what background we were from because we had a Scottish and an English accent. We put it this way, we were the only two people who would even had any time for the Labour Party. That's how right wing they are, you know. Yeah, yeah. So like you're talking about a very narrow base of people involved in Irish journalism. Um, a very narrow ideological viewpoints getting narrower all the time. Like you used to have uh, the Workers' Party had an illustrious tradition of publications and a lot of these people went on to be fairly major journalists. Uh, the only one of them there's a few of them still working. Most of them are in faculties of journalism, teaching journalism, uh, because there isn't there isn't room in the mainstream Irish media for uh, people of a progressive bend. I truly believe that. Like you know, it's uh, and not to say that these people, some of my best friends are journalists, you know, uh, but they they're just from different backgrounds. You know, mm -hmm. they're just from backgrounds that are closer to Aylesbury Road and that than they are to Ballymun and that, and that is not acceptable. We can't be sitting back and going. Uh, it's all right, we can keep on producing our own little left things and talking to ourselves. No, we have to make an intervention in the state and have, have organs that do allow the voices of normal people and people that aren't going to go with the, the consensus. Like, on Liberty, we've changed that quite radically, myself and Frank, over the last 18 months. It used to be full of officials, mainly just pictures of officials and officials telling you what they've done. 
they're all gone now. The, the last one, uh, I've had about 16, 17 interviews with just workers in it. I was also happy the last one was the first one that was no politician writing for it. Uh, you know, as an elected politician. Uh, we've heard enough from these people. It's a little cosy club, it really is. Whatever party they're representing over there in the doll. And uh, there just is a need for us to produce our own media. And I'm the only group of people that I've seen that have really been taking a real interest in this after the demise of the Workers' Party or the Workers' Solidarity Movement, you know? And it's just a shame that we, um, the Labour Party, I'll tell you, I was once involved in that organisation. We tried to set up a journal, um, and foolishly, me, I had something about uh, Tommy Sheridan. This is before his, uh, his other activities became widely knowledge, and whatever he wants to get up to is his own business. But um, I had something about him and that the Scottish Socialist Party is going to do good. It's only years later I realised that's why there was never any funding again for that publication. You know, oh, yeah. they had no interest in debate, no interest in ideology. So um, but I know, I know that, that there has been, been you know, discussions over the last few years about this sort of right wing, how right wing the, the Irish printed press is, and, and you know, both the entry, the entry of some of the British journals, but also you know the closure of the Irish press and, and it changing yeah. the nature. But uh, you know, by definition, a, a printed journal costs money, you know, yeah. and, and there's a significant amount of capital to, that you need access to at the very least. You need to rent a, a large printing press. You need a distribution centre and things. And these are all owned by organisations. But, but why, is why, it possible to engage of with, course, with that? In, in other countries, there's the media is owned by the people as well. If you look at the, the French elections, there's Le Humain, there's Liberation. Like, these are left-wing newspapers. It's been a failure of the Irish left. Like, the Irish left can complain and say, oh, that we don't own the print presses. Why don't they own the print presses? Like it's not. We do represent the uh, interests of the majority, you know. Mm -hmm. And it is the norm in other countries that the left has made in several countries in Britain. Even maybe the left is nearly a majority in the media, you know. Trump, like what's his name that does uh, the economics on um, on Newsnight? Paul Mason. Paul Mason. Paul Mason is quite yeah. clearly somebody of the left, and yet he decides what, yeah, what yeah. the economic yeah. view is on that. In the Irish media, that is just not possible. We do live in a conservative society. We do have problems that, other, that Britain hasn't had to deal with or France hasn't had to deal with. But now that the Catholic Church is, thankfully, under, on its way out, please God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's managed to survive quite a bit up the next, Scott. <laughs> well, I think Brady parading around uh, at this Eucharist conference could be the end of it. But... Um, now we do have an opportunity, I do believe that, we have an opportunity at the moment uh, that the Irish media has grown in on itself so much and there is an ideological space there. If, if our generation doesn't manage to produce a proper left-wing institution of the media, we only have ourselves to blame, you know? But, and I, I think just after all the nice words that were said about the WSM, I think this is a good time for Andrew to explain why you don't believe the WSM should be in print anymore or should be focusing on online. Just the, uh, well, it's it's not it's not that we I mean you know as I said three thousand of these four thousand of these yeah. you know we're, we're still quite committed to print. Um, what we've abandoned is trying to sell stuff, um, and the major reason for that was the realization that none of us got involved in revolutionary politics because we wanted to do sales outside the GPO, uh, and it's also a really ineffective way of distributing ideas. You know, it's so it's slow. not the definition of revolutionary politics. In this was, yeah, I think we were kind of like. I, Ten years ago, this went free. Actually, twelve years ago now, uh, around the kind of Seattle period was when we made that decision, and it was one of the most probably liberating things I think we decided then, because suddenly there was all this time freedom, where previously we'd stand around trying to flog ten papers in. How an did hour you raise the funds? Um, well, the th but the thing is, <laughs> like, 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 like most left-wing publications, small left-wing publications, uh, uh, publications don't make money. Yeah. You know, they didn't make money when we printed them either, you know, because you're doing small print runs, you're not selling them for that much, you're still making a loss on them. Uh, and actually, the, 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 the loss you make printing them free isn't that much bigger. So, you know, we fund ourselves out of members' service, like members put in a 2 to 4% of their income, and that's how we fund the activity, that's how we fund the book print, that's where that all happens. These are the party, or, well, the WSM yeah. members. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we get some donations as well. Uh, but I mean, that, you know, so that's the model. But I think the print model is still important to us because. You know, it enables you to, to quite effectively go to specific groups of people and at least hand them something to read. There's no real equivalent way of doing that on the internet. On the internet, it's, it's more about people being able to follow you. 
uh, you know, a big benefit the internet has if we actually have a really big story to break, then it means that can get out really fast and go to a lot of people. And I think the real challenge that, you know, that's obviously lacking in Ireland, Scott was talking of it, a bit there, is we, what we don't have is a newspaper. You know, we read those magazines, those different, all these different distribution models. They're all right, but they're no use if you actually want to influence news as it happens. You can comment on it a month afterwards. Uh, but like, so one of the things I was quite involved in during the year was the breaking of the whole uh, Garda rape tape, Corrib story, you know, and that was done completely online. Uh, also being done with the mainstream press because we needed to get that stuff. Well, say so you only press. had one journalist that was willing to really follow yeah. that up, and those people are getting more and more sidelined. You know? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean that was the real limitation. I mean, you know, the, the a load of news organisations were given that story 24 hours before it went out. You know, only only really a couple of them went with it and um, RTE just sat in it you know mm -hmm. and just completely didn't cover it at all and we were kind of you know some people were hammering them on Twitter about it all day and they, it was literally like 12 hours after everybody else had covered it that actually done it but that was that was to me a good example of a combined use of a kind of internet and media strategy because part of the reason we were able to break that it was a show to see on WSM but I'm involved in that as well was because we put the tapes online you know so we had 70,000 people listen to it and 24 hours or something absolutely extraordinary like that. It was all internet driven. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think th those different models are different parts, but I really wouldn't underrate the, the online end of it as well. There's a different sort of engagement happening there that's given us a reach that there's no way we could do in printed form. We don't have the time and mm -hmm. the money for doing that sort yeah. of distribution, much as we looked at a daily paper, but that's not going to be happening anytime soon. Um, unless the Workers' Party funded or something. <laughs> we're, all, we're going to take pictures now for the last half an hour. Everybody just draws pictures of it again. Well, so to come in on, on, to, on to Rabble, I mean, you, you talked about being reader-supported, but, uh, you know, I mean, there's a group of people who have to do work, and up to now, I, I don't know who has been coming in and saying that they're going to pay for, for the printing and pay for the distribution and the cost in it. I mean, you've got adverts uh, in, yeah, in the journal. Yeah, I mean, journal. I think that when people look at print, there's a, there's a fatalism attitude where it's like when Brano was saying, you can never get in decent, like they're, you know, right-wing capitalist, but a phone call sorted that out, do you know? Um, you know, how do you get something printed? You ring a printer and get a print quote, you know? And, you know, it costs us, like, you know, about basically under a grand to print 5,000 copies. We can print twice that amount for, like, you know, 1,150 euro, like, you know? Mm -hmm. And the reason, we, the reason we don't is because sometimes if you stop making money at a gig, uh, we may not have the ability to distribute it because mm -hmm. we don't have a solidified network yet. But you know, they're not insurmountable things really, like, you know. Yeah. Um, w one of the things I find most interesting about kind of doing the Rabble project is that people do have these huge awarenesses of like the lack of clarity in the Irish media, you know, and people will, t I think, talk about the fatalist manner about it, like, you know, mm -hmm. going from doing like small left-wing projects to how we build, you know, counter institutions like The Guardian, and there's no, there's no in-between, like, you know, um, and I think one, one of the things that it's, it's sort of entertaining is, I guess, you know, we, we get most of our money through doing, doing gigs and then sort of like, you know, ads that veer between we manage to do a hustle with a coffee shop or something and basically people like who just fill up the space and give us a donation on the back of it. Like, mm -hmm. um, but I think something that we want to take more seriously to allow us time to breed and develop the paper is getting it on a firmer basis of subscribers, so on and so forth, people who like, you know, donate a tenner a month this kind of thing, and that will allow us to breed and develop it. And I think it's actually a consequence of the internet, maybe, that that hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. That people do expect things to just come for free, you know, and they don't basically... Look Left is the only journal here that's been, been charged for, isn't it? No, for Raggers. For Raggers as well? Yeah. Okay. And, and was that... I mean, do you find it difficult? Is there resi the resistance to people paying for the journal, or does it... Uh, you know, it, does it enter into it at all? What, why... Because, I mean, obviously... There's a huge amount of labour and unpaid work going into the journal, and you're probably it's difficult to cover print costs anyway with, with what's been paid. So why why are you charging and what is not? Um, well, I suppose to be in Easons, you have to charge anyway. Okay. But uh, th there's also a, a thing which uh, probably a lot of people in the room won't agree with. I think that when you put a monetary uh, something on on a magazine or on anything, it gives someone more value, so they're less likely to throw it away in the bus and they'll keep it and they'll read page to page to pay two quid for it. Um, but there's, there's just two other things I'd like to say. The, the whole, the whole uh, question that's been asked by this, I suppose, is: is a radical media, uh, a radical media, is it? Can can you can you do it in Ireland? Can it be done? And if you look back to that look left on DCTV, I think Gralton and Z Magazine and stuff like that, none of them ever seem to go past issue 12 or 
issue 10. So they, they proved like back then that maybe the couldn't TV be done. series that stuttered at five. And oh, we no, have no, six not that has uh, ever been produced. So <laughs> I, know, I know the problems that they, they yeah. face. No, but not, not, yeah. the, not the TV series, the actual the okay, magazines yeah, yeah. that people <laughs> looking at. They never seemed to get past issue 10 or whatever. So there was, there was always some reason there. I suppose the 80s, the 70s, different times, stuff, so stuff, different stuff was happening, people were shooting off or whatever. But I think there's, when you walk into Ethan's, I can name about three Irish magazines that I'd be willing to buy. Uh, Village, Hot Press, Look Left. Um, but if, if, you, if you look at every other magazine on the shelves in Eason's, just, just a proliferation. There seems to be what happens in Africa with, uh, with European company or countries dumping food supplies or, or meat in Africa. It seems like the British market has just dumped all its magazines onto the Irish market. And you, you, if you even look away from, uh, from the newspapers. So if you want to buy a political magazine in Ireland and you, you, Village or Look Left don't happen to be on the shelf, what are you left with? You're left with New Statesman, you're left with Red Pepper, you're left with everything that's, that's British Centre. And as Scott said to me before, like people in Ireland probably vote for the Labour Party because they read New Statesman and think it's a good party. She's got the inside so don't get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but the Labour Party is so good. It, the, 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 only, the, the, only, the only kind of political reading in like the mainstream shops in Ireland is it, it's it's, it's, it's saturated by the British market. So I, I think it's good to have something. Not, not to be nationalistic about it, but something Irish there that people can go in and buy and, and read about stuff that's happening on their own island. But Reddy sent me a, an email a couple of months back, and, it, and it's interesting that where it's kicking off most now in the Western world, I suppose, is, is in Canada. Like, uh, it's kicking off quite a lot over there. But uh, Reddy, Reddy could maybe talk about this more, that the, the tax that the Canadian government uh, have to have indigenous magazines grow, and there's, there's radical magazines growing because the Canadian government are actually being sound about it, and, and, and they don't want the they don't want to have what happens in Ireland, where it's just complete saturation by the British market, where every, every, the, you, you can't get an indigenous magazine into onto the mainstream shelves because it's so hard. The Canadian government actually have a progressive tax that allows people to, to do that. So I, I think to, to answer the question of can can a radical or left of centre or whatever magazine thrive in Ireland, the village try to do it once a week. Like everything is stacked against you. So I don't know. <laughs> Probably. To, to answer the question, I'd, like not not looking at the internet, but looking at can the magazine thrive? Yeah, probably not in the long run, unless a lot of people come behind it. And did, did you want to explain why we need a state press here? The, the anarchist book well, fair, I don't, I don't <laughs> know. Know. <laughs> to make the argument for a state well, press, radical press. press. It, 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 goes back, it goes back to that fatalism thing again. I mean, it's like you know, we have a list on our website where a magazine is, and then we put like three issues of it into Dublin South Library. And then we get an email off somebody and they're going, can you pick up your magazines, please? We can't stock them, they're biased. And I wonder like, how much of that was to do with the fact that the cover was taking the piss out of the council tax, you know? But um, that's interesting. You, you know what I mean? Like, that's just pure political censorship. Like, um, you know, we got Labour Party Council to pursue this, and the only excuse they could give us was a uh, policy from their stock acquisition thing, where if you're purchasing stuff, it has to be unbiased. But th these are institutions that we pay for with our taxes. And yet you can't we can't distribute our magazines through them, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, yet Metro Air and so on, which is great, is in there, you know. So yeah, who yeah. who's making these choices? Like, you know what I mean? But the, what the, the thing that Brian was talking about in Canada is the Canadian per, 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 periodical fund, mm -hmm. and it, it is based off some level of progressive taxation on, you know, non-indigenous magazines. And then there's a fund created for anybody who's done a print run over of over 500 to access the fund, uh, you know. Administrative costs, offices, everything else that goes with doing a magazine. Norway does something similar, does it? Like yeah, a lot yeah. of countries actually yeah. do try and encourage newspapers. Some, I think, some of the Italian. I was only having a look there. Um, what is it? Publico was the one in Spain that's going down them. The, the new publication, and all that, but all then got grants from the state to begin with because mm -hmm. they re, they understand there's a need for the pure the purity of media. Like you know, yeah, that's yeah. a normal civic value in Western European countries, not in Ireland. Uh, Pat Rabbit. Is talking about all this plurality, but I think he means Tony O'Reilly has to take control of the Sunday Indo, you know? That's where we're, uh, that, that, that's the level we're coming from. But I think we wouldn't want to be too down on the Irish uh, progressive media. There was publications that, that continued for a very long time, the United Irishmen, the Irish people, and Fublock in its first uh, incarnation, and its second incarnation was definitely a, an oppositional publication. Um, the Republican left has produced down the years has been the main producer of uh, the alternative media, the alternative source of media. Now I've had a look through the Workers' Party records and that, and I tell you there was quite a lot of libel stuff put into the United Irishmen in that, but <coughs> they were put in the bin or a letter was sent back, yeah we got that from you Seamus Brennan, forget about it. Yeah, yeah. Now that's because those papers were in organisations that were beyond the law of the state. 
So if you want to try and grow something and, uh, and to keep it within the law of the state uh, in Ireland at the moment, with the liable laws, with the ownership laws, with people like Dermot Desmond, who if you say something good or bad about him, you'll get a legal letter, just so, it co just so it takes time for your legal team in the paper, so your editor always goes, don't say anything about Dermot. Never mention the guy, even though the guy's maybe the number one mm -hmm. obstacle to... Uh, well, I and, and I mean, all, all of this obviously, society. you know, creates an overhead and creates barriers to people coming in and... and, and uh, just just on De De Dennis O'Brien, big article in the Sunday Times about how the guy probably doesn't have any money anymore in the British Sunday Times. Yeah. Not published in the Irish Sunday Times. Two things, personal connections between the editor of the Sunday Times and Dennis O'Brien, and also worried about liable and that. Our media here, the mainstream media, is just not fit for purpose. And that should be good for us, <laughs> you know, because people are looking for other, other sources of information. Okay, yeah, I, I think I'm conscious of the time, so it's, it's 22, one now, so I do want to sort of create a bit of space <coughs> for people to come in. Um, does anybody on the floor have any questions? Yeah, I have two questions. I have two questions. The first one is probably uh, extremely stupid, and the second one is borderline irrelevant. But uh, still, the first one is, uh, for those uh, who might be interested in contributing or getting involved, like what would be the first step that you kind of you go for on that? And the second question, uh, just as Brian mentioned, uh, coming to me, uh, bringing out a book, and after we're talking about old media versus kind of new media and stuff, just wondering uh, where you kind of come in. You were talking about um, how, in a lot of countries, you mentioned in Greece, you know, where the partners actually read, or whoever was, you were speaking to had read these books, and that was why she was, you know, a socialist or an anarchist. And the reason that I and a lot of other people became uh, left wing was because of the books that we were reading growing up. We didn't really you know, get it from magazines or newspapers or uh, media. So I'm just wondering, like, what would be your kind of take on the importance of books, of, for example, like the media you bring out on and so on? We might take a couple. Uh, I think Dermot will come in, or maybe somebody else. Uh, I've got really so much to say on this that uh, it's just not possible to say it all. So I'm just going to confine it to a couple of points. Um, one of the points it seems to me is that um, when people are talking about this around the table, uh, when when they start talking about uh, the media and you know how bad it is here, yeah, I agree that uh, we do uh, moan about it and don't really get around to doing something about it. But also, uh, I think it's naive to expect uh, the media. You can ask for a more liberal media and a more inclusive media, but at the end of the day, it's still a capitalist media. And uh, the question is, are we for revolution, or are we just for having, uh, you know, painting things a little bit more left? And um, that's, I think, uh, an important issue. And the other thing is, when people were talking about distribution, organisation, uh, internet versus um, um, uh, versus print, um, one of the big issues for me, I think, in talking about all this is. Let's look at the reality of what we've got. We've got about 300, 400 activists in, in Dublin, uh, in everything. And um, just the number of, you know, to talk about liberty, the number they produce, I've seen piles of liberty sitting around, nobody reading it. And so another issue for me would be as well, how much are these um, uh, publishers willing to accept criticism? Because uh, I can't see liberty, printing criticism of SIPTU, because they could fill up that page very quickly with criticism of SIPTU. I know that as a SIPTU member. Um, and finally, it would be really good in a discussion like this to look back to workers' uh, newspapers in, you know, uh, at the turn of the century, when street sellers were organized and sold, sold as well, and got, from what I understand, a bigger commission for selling uh, the union paper and the uh, communist paper than they did from uh, the independent. Um, we might take the, take the two questions. Um, so, contributing and the role of books, and then why aren't you doing anything about media uh, and creating something other than media? And the, the rest of Dermot's is your own actor. Andrew? Um, 
Contributions, uh, yeah, actually, we, we, we're pretty open to people writing for us. Uh, the website's fairly straightforward. Uh, uh, most issues of the magazine actually also carry articles from guest writers, so you know, just contact us about that. Um, books, I think, yeah, I agree they're really important. They're also really expensive, and the hard, it's a very slow distribution. Uh, so you, you have the problem, we print some pamphlets, but I mean, typically the problem have, you, you have is you print a thousand of them, you're putting a fair bit of money in that, they take up quite a bit of space, and then they trickle out quite slowly over a long period of time. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure, given, because actually I think what Dennis <coughs> pointed to in terms of the number of activists and all is important, you know, like it, all very well talking about, well, you know, what happens in France or whatever else, but in those countries you're talking about places where quite a percentage of the population is relatively left-wing. Uh, quite a lot of people have had at least past involvement. Here that's a very much smaller number, so that there isn't really the same sort of base to pull on. Um, and that, what was the other one, sorry? Well, uh, just in, in terms, are, are we actually serious about trying to create something? Right, yeah, I mean... I, I suppose also just on the editorial policy on the WSM, uh, I mean, it, it, the, are, are you, is there an editorial line through all your press? Are they um, propaganda pieces in, in the original sense of the word? I think probably the, the paper is much more of an editorial line, you know, it's relatively brief, it, it more or less about explaining what a position is on various questions. There's been some experimentation around that, but that, that seems to be the thing that works for us. Uh, the magazine is much more kind of, here's some interesting ideas that we think are relevant, obviously from an anarchist perspective, but, you know, it, it's much more of a kind of discussion and an attempt to draw people into a conversation. The web stuff is a mixture of both. Um, you know, so we've had very long, I, I wrote a long opinion piece on Libya last year that was quite controversial, for instance. Uh, you know, so we do that, but then we also again have, have the uh, brief of stuff. I mean, I think, I'd, I'd be critical of, of what exactly the potential is to create and sustain a proper left-wing paper in Ireland until you have a much bigger left-wing audience. And of course, that's a catch-22 situation. How do you do one without the other? Um, I think it, it's definitely something that is worth exploring, and I think actually the sort of changes you're talking about liberty um, that have come in are really interesting, but I also agree with, um, again, what Jeremy was saying, that I, I remember a sitcom, I've never, I never get it, you know, I don't know where the hell it's going, it, it, it never goes out, and I'm in a, a branch that's fairly active, which is the education branch. You know, Give so me your address. I occasionally get it off activists and sitcom, they'll hand it to me to the paper bundle, but so that distribution model obviously yeah. still exists there, but yeah, I mean, it would seem to be the big question of if you were going to do something that was, a, you know, actually had some resemblance to a newspaper being able to report the news, so at least was weekly, would require very large, that's a lot of money you're talking about, and that would seem to have to come out of the union movement. Uh, but the union movement is so tied to social partnership and everything else that they're not, most of those papers would not publish a lot of the stuff we'd actually want to say. So, you know, putting a lot of effort into building that would have a question over it. Um, our focus basically is on building a, you know, a fairly explicit anarchist revolutionary press, but that's what we can do. Yeah. Um, we haven't put that much effort into trying to build a broader thing, except in the early years of indie media, which kind of eventually stuttered to what indie media is today, so we, we put a lot less effort into that. Uh, I think the, uh, you know, the, the rabble model I also actually think is a very interesting one to pursue, but again, it's a different one to what we're doing. Like, there's a certain synergy, I think, between yeah, what people yeah, are yeah, doing around the table. Um, yeah, it's important to books. I mean, yeah, books are good. People should read them. Do you know? I mean, <laughs> you know, I take that from the book fair. You know, yeah. <laughs> books are good. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, the, I think the thing to look about about books is, I mean, they're kind of going through in a way similar crisis to print media. You think about it. You know what I mean? Um, or is it a crisis or a new birth or whatever? Like, you know, one thing that I think is great about books is that there is still somewhat of a thriving, basically. Well, I wouldn't say it's thriving, but you know, an independent bookseller scene that we'll take our magazines, distribute them, and will give us ethical ads, you know, that's great. What, what more can you really say on it? They're facing the problem of monopolisation as well, of course. I think the question, maybe that it's probably better if the whole panel moves to discuss it, is actually, yeah, is it naive to think you can reform capitalist media? Obviously it's naive, like, do you know what I mean? But I don't, I don't think kind of saying that again and again and again is going to change anything. Do you know what I mean? If you look at, if you look at like, Korea, or like South Korea, there's like a, a quarter of a million daily newspaper that's, like, funded to its readers given like you know a euro a month or whatever like, do you know what I mean like you know uh, 500,000 people putting their hand in their pocket and funding the thing do you know what I mean that's a model we can use here you know yeah. and we're not pursuing it like do you know what I mean it's just people are asking questions going why don't you do something about it and we're sitting here going well we're trying like, do you know um, but the readers are passive 
You know, it's the same way people people aren't joining their trade unions. Do you know what I mean? Or they're not getting active in their branches or giving well, out. There, there is a role for organisers as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason people yeah. don't try join trade unions is because nobody asks them. Yeah. Perhaps the reason people and they aren't don't engage in our yeah. press is because we're not out talking to so them. What we need to be looking at is building like a counter hegemonic form. I mean, that's what the, the original working class press was for. It was to build a community of workers that could develop a sense of power and act on that power. I mean, and I think that's something we're trying to do with our audience is actually develop a sense of ident identity and move them to a position of acting or at least a sense of ethics and social solidarity and so on. In terms of like papers lying around, we, we genuinely don't have any copies left of issue one or two. We maybe have like a hundred of each preserved for the archive, like that's 5,000 gone. I mean, the traditional analysis of print media is that, I don't believe that like half of them go unread. I'd say our readership could be 10, 15,000, but things get passed around. I do want people to read it on the bus and throw it on the next seat for the next person to read it. That's the traditional strategy of being print media, you know? In terms of looking back again, yeah, we should look back, but I'm, I'm not going to sit around and like, fetchize the fact that people who were unemployed stood on the street selling a workers' newspaper for a little bit more than what the bosses were going to offer them. I mean, that, that was the situation at that time. I mean, our front cover for last issue is direct reference to the character of Blockhead in the industrial worker, you know, the, the guy who's always, you know, towing the boss's line. I mean, people have these awarenesses, but how do, we, how do we treat that past with respect and then just get the fuck away from it? and set up a daily newspaper with a subscription rate of a quarter of a million that we control as a community and a working class, you know? So, Scott. Yeah, no, I don't believe there is, a, there is a small audience. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that. I don't believe there is a small audience. Uh, the Labour Party, how many votes did they get in the last election? They were elected because they gave a left-wing agenda. Uh, Sinn Féin have a lot of votes uh, in the polls now. Uh, there's a large amount of people out there that would be very interested in uh, reading progressive, not, 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 not saying a progressive newspaper, I think the newspaper idea, I think it's now for organisation that's necessary, but I think maybe it will be going for more just a media outlet with on various platforms. Um, now the thing is, like in other Irish uh, crises, uh, our readership may be exported abroad, like that's that's what quite well happened, well it's pointless us sitting here going, oh there's no readership out there, no they are out there, if we aren't reaching them, that's a question for ourselves, that's a question for us in Liberty, that does make us sweat, we know there's loads of them sitting around. On the issue of having criticism in there, um, I won't go into too much detail, but uh, they, um, the only reason to have a newspaper is to have ideological debate, to have debate on issues as well <coughs> as news. Unless we manage to introduce that properly into Liberty, then it will be of no value. Currently, we do take people from Labour Party, people from Sinn Féin. That's seen as a discussion of views. For me, that, that's not enough, and that has to be developed. And, it, and there has to be aimed criticism at what people are doing, and people will have to be big enough to take that criticism. That, that's, some, that's something that we have to work on. Um, on the idea of the institution, there is no reform of the capitalist media. There is no reform of a media which is driven by advertising, which is driven by, uh, in a certain newspaper, the Sunday Times, when you're called in and told, look, you have to have young women between this age group, hopefully, interview them for stories. They're the advertisers, that's what they want. And it's that straight up. You know, it's driven by, by the needs of, of the advertisers, where you get advertisers ringing up and going, I'd rather if you don't write that story about me and my guys because we might not put the advertising in. I've actually had that set as in the past before. So there is no reform of that. What you have to set up is other institutions that are media institutions but are not driven solely by that model. It's been done numerous times before. The Guardian's originally set up by the Chartists, I think. Uh, the Irish Times is originally a trust and I think you can, you can actually uh, look at the decline of that into just a stunning publication it is these days. <laughs> Uh, from when that trust was basically broken up. And that trust was an upper class Protestant trust, but it was still like, we want to present a different view, we want to do this thing, we're not in it for the money, money's grubby. That was. Mm -hmm. So these things can be done. It's done with other newspapers, as Reddy was saying there, South Korea, I wasn't aware of that one. In France, there's newspapers, Le Humain isn't out there as a big uh, money making operation, it loses money continually. The Morning Star is just over the, over the water. It's, it's an all right little publication, and it also affects the Mirror and, uh, and other, um, other British publications. The Guardian I no longer think is the greatest model for it because on their world affairs reporting, 
<laughs> it's questionable who's, who's judging that for them. But I think we, we aren't talking, people shouldn't be looking to set up another capitalist newspaper. It should be um, a progressive institution. Uh, that's what people, uh, that's what needs to be set up. And then journalists would be trained and come, get experience there, and then they'd go in and infest the rest of the media. And, and just quickly before, we been, your view on books, your four books? Yeah. Nothing, don't like them, don't read them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. <laughs> don't take them. <laughs> um, I don't think anyone at this table is naive to think that uh, we can change the, the so-called right-wing press that they're not right wing. That's they, 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 there's, there's no one goes into the press going, oh, now I'm a right wing journalist. It's it, it's just the ideology that's that's present in the media. It's it's like I I, I went to journalism college. A lot of uh, it was it was it was basically a left wing course we were taught. A lot of those people are now in newspapers. I doubt they're still coming out with the left wing stuff they were coming out with around in in the student bar. They said, all right, this is this this is the way it is. This is the culture in this newsroom. This is the way I'm going to report on things. Uh, I don't think anyone here would be naive to think that we can we can make it nicer. On your view of, uh, are we just trying to paint things? Are we just trying to paint things a little bit more left wing, or trying to push for revolution? I think uh, from Andrew across, I think everyone here will obviously be pushing towards that end goal. But like that doesn't mean that your your magazine has to be dogmatic and end every every uh, story with and onwards to the revolution, you know. Um, uh, on on the question of how do you contribute, you send an email. Um, I, I, I really don't know what was the, what was the rest of them. Oh, on, on books. Uh, I, yeah, I, I didn't come left wing from reading books, but I suppose a lot of other people did. But uh, yeah, books are good. And uh, Mark Hoskins, who'll be speaking later, doesn't like books. He's into, <laughs> he's, uh, into the Ken Kindle model, but I think that brings us back to, to the top. But uh, yeah. Um, in terms of contributors, we, we don't really take outside uh, contribution except for other anarcho-feminist organizations around the world. Um, but we are obviously always looking for new members. And at the moment, um, as I said, we're kind of uh, reimagining our whole organization and even potentially changing the name. Uh, so if anybody is interested in, in that, definitely let us know. Criticism. Just, I know we're ending up. Um, Obviously, we don't have massive readerships, and we're not influencing the the agenda the way the Sunday newspapers are. Though some the Sunday newspapers have started quoting Look Left, uh, but not given the, the given us the source as the quote. The Sunday Indo. The Sunday Indo. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I I do think that this is like we've got what three, four, five. We've got five people sitting around a table talking about the radical uh, the, or the left of centre publications that they're involved in. I think that's a really good spot. We're in the midst of a really shit fucking recession where everyone's leaving the country and you've got people here and, and a lot of people involved with the magazines trying to push forward a, a, an alternative agenda or trying to just push and do something that's that's a little bit good, you know, and I, I think it's a really uh, healthy state. You can, you can go on all day about how apathetic the Irish people are, how we're controlled by this, how the media is crap, but it's still, it's a really healthy state, I think, that you have, uh, and not, not, not to blow my own trump or around like that. Um, <laughs> And cotton words, but I think it's a really healthy state that you have rabble, you have uh, rag, you have, yeah, and you have uh, you have the WSM, you have Look Left pushing out these magazines. I think I think it's it's a healthy enough state um, to be in, rather than having absolutely nothing. Any more contributions? Or are we one at the back, two in the middle? Yeah, more or less at the time. More or less at the time. Yeah. Okay, very quickly, we've only about sort of three or four minutes. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm, I didn't really learn about anarchism initially from books I liked that over the internet. The only thing I've learned from my experience is to so read books more thoroughly now. Um, one thing I've learned is that dividing publication into simply the internet and press, I think, or um, the internet and paper, Publications um, is a bit too sharp for students. Uh, I think, in so much as just as there are various different formats of paper distribution, there are also various different websites with different surrounding cultures and mechanisms. Um, for example, uh, for Facebook, uh, that is an invaluable resource for event organization. Uh, the legalized cannabis marches were arranged very thoroughly through Facebook, the, the recent events. 
and uh, my daughter has been fully supported as well by uh, helping me with that as well. Yeah. But um, as far as I'm aware of it, anyway, uh, the new app YouTube is more of a, a uh, theoretical kind of discussion type thing, but also has the ability to sort of raise awareness. And Twitter, which every which occasionally is used to reference stuff, but uh, I'll try to put it. It's good. <sighs> I don't use Twitter.com. But um, what I was thinking was that um, because a lot of the publications are very niche focused, a lot of the paper publications, I think the internet is useful for, and I hate this expression, but I do think it fits here, um, because so many charity organizations use it, raising awareness that you can get people who um, develop an interest in anarchism and want to learn more because they're curious, rather than just trying to hang around um, publications to any random person, some of whom may have uh, an immediate, sometimes stereotypical, certain but still uh, immediately negative reaction to anything uh, anarchist they speak um, That's all I really need to say on that. Come back. You. Mark, the tent down there, and then one over. Yeah. Hi, thank you for uh, the talks. Um, actually, my impact to what Ibis is talking about. Um, so, this is more of a suggestion or a comment. Uh, I'm not like, totally familiar with what you're doing, uh, on, just based on what you've mentioned, but it seems, it seems to be that you have a good barrier, you know, uh, making your information accessible. Uh, and, uh, and also bringing awareness. So it seems to be that uh, there is still this continuing uh, methods of trying to reach people, which is more or less the same as what the left or the right doesn't matter, it's what everybody wants. And what's, what's, what's apparent is that the information that you're trying to reveal, the data, underneath it is not as accessible as it should be. So, uh, part of me for saying that it seems like you're still trying to preach to the choir as opposed to, you know, uh, reach more people by different methods. So it has nothing to do with the medium that you're using, but more of the, uh, the quality of the information you're presenting. So, and I'm not talking about, you know, writing academic papers or anything like that, but if, and I don't mean to imply that you're not, to walk, but you are, uh, you know, putting out some information there. Uh, show your assumption and the, the source of the data to, that you know you came to conclusion with, uh, because the general public may understand this information that you have, or they, they might follow up from it as opposed to you know looking up a big paragraph about what you're trying to yeah. say. So they're telling me that I'm going to have to wrap up. Did you want something very quick to work? No. no. Okay, I, just to, to, to finish up, I'd, I'd like to, to thank everybody who came in, and, and I think one of the things that uh, Kevin said is very true, I think the, the strength of the journals that are here, the range, does see, show that people are still trying to work in, in print and still trying to actually use it as an organising tool. And I just leave you, I know Reddy went off and had a look at Lenin. I had a look at Gramsci when I came in here, and I think that the story of uh, Novin, Novo Ordine, and the idea that this left-wing journal was ready when the factory councils happened actually meant that it could be a tool that was taken up by other people. So I think one of the things is that to look at these journals and to look at other journals as tools that we can all use when the need arises and to, that it's important that they still exist. Okay, thank you very much.